My name is Jordan Quinn. I'm a Zero Developer Evangelist based in Melbourne, Australia. Today, I'm joined by my fellow developer evangelists, the amazing Grace and Jenks. In today's webinar, Jenks will go through the topic of migrating from OAuth 1 to OAuth 2. He'll present for about 15 minutes, and then he'll show us what a token migration looks like. Uh, afterwards, we'll have a bit of a Q&A session. Now, during the webinar, please make good use of the Q&A function in Zoom. Uh, uh, my colleague Grace and I will try to answer as many questions as we can today. Now, if you missed something in this webinar, don't worry. Uh, we are recording this webinar, and the recording will be made available for everyone to watch later. Well, that's enough of me, I think. I'll hand it over to Jenks from here to show us some strategies we can use to migrate to OAuth 2. Over to you, Jenks. Thank you so much for the introduction, Jordan. Hello, everyone. My name is Jenks, developer evangelist based in Melbourne. I am delivering this talk today from a southeastern suburb in Victoria that is currently firmly locked down due to COVID. Yes, for the second time. Grace has joined us all the way from Auckland today. Do you want to say hi to everyone, Grace? Hey, everyone. Nice to see you. We'll be answering some of your questions later. Sweet. Thank you all for being here today and thank you for your efforts you have put in to building to zero API. Before I start, I would like to let you know that the migration path today that I'm talking about is for zero accounting integration, which includes zero accounting API, fixed assets, projects, payment, payroll, and HP, uh, HQ APIs. Workflow Max and Zero Practice Manager APIs migration path is covered in Zero uh, Workflow Max API documentation page. This migration path is designed for partner apps who have many connections to migrate over without disruption to the users. If you have little connection numbers and don't mind having the user to go through uh, real authentication with Zero, this talk will not be as essential. Let's get started with how to migrate to zero OAuth 2. In this talk, I'll go through some concepts of token migration, the difference between OAuth 1 and OAuth 2 tokens, and share a few tips on making the process robust and easy. As most of you probably are here because we have heard the OAuth 1.0a will be fully deprecated in March 2021. This means regardless which application type you're on, you will need to build to zero OAuth 2 framework and be able to maintain the connections or the user's authorization to your application. If you're already an app partner, you'll remember in OAuth 1, Zero API had three types of applications. Private apps is used for integrating to a single Zero organization. Public app has access token that only lasts for 30 minutes and cannot be refreshed. Partner apps, which is an upgrade you can get after completing certification with us to obtain long-term API connections by refreshing the access token. In OAuth 2, we're removing the concept of private and public apps and promote everyone to the partner apps. This means only partner apps can use our migration endpoint to complete a migration without disruption to users. For those of you migrating from private and public apps, your user will be required to go through zero logging to re-authenticate and use zero OAuth 2 flow to reauthorize your application. As of March 2021, we'll only have a single API application type. I'm going to pause here and ask Grace to send out a poll to see what uh, types of uh, apps everyone is, uh, is using now. Thank you, Grace. Poll is there already. The most important reason as to why Zero is having this migration is to reduce the complexity in our API authentication and to make our platform more secure due to regulatory requirements. We're blessed with a diverse ecosystem. So tens of thousands of developers, users who are building solutions to solve our Zero users problems. This upgrade will free us from maintaining complex outdated OAuth 1 authentication framework and unblock us from shipping new API features that will delight our developer and app community. Thank you for your commitment to building to zero ecosystem and we appreciate your patience and effort in this OAuth migration with us. 
I can see the poor result here. Um, there's a, it's a, the numbers are literally changing still, but there is about uh, one third of people on private apps, OS1 private apps, and one third of people on uh, the OS1 public uh, one partner app, and about 10% on OS1 public app. I'll, I'll let Grace close the poll a little bit later so we can get everyone's responses in. And I'll go on to talk about the code changes you might need in this migration, which I'm sure a lot of developers will be interested in hearing. The biggest question from uh, what, when I get from the developers is, what does this migration mean to my code base? Do I need to rewrite it from scratch or can I reuse some of it? There are two major parts of the code changes you need to complete in this migration. Enable to interface with our OAuth 2 APIs. The first one is adding the new access token authorization header with the bare string syntax as shown on the screen here. So authorization bare plus access token. Well, there's a space after bare. And also you will need another header in your API call, which is called zero tenant ID. And that is the organization ID uh, from zero accounting. OS2 now authorizes at a user level. So token now is associated with a single zero user instead of to a specific zero organization. This means a user can potentially authorize your app and read from and write to multiple zero orgs that they are part of in the same access token. To expand on this point a little bit, I can see the pool result now. Pool has closed 34% private apps, 36% uh, uh, partner apps, and 10% public apps. Great, thanks for your feedback. So to expand on the point of um, uh, identity mapping change, uh, the largest conceptual change in this migration is that we're going to change the identity mapping between your app to zero from a one-to-one -one relationship to a one-to-many relationship. One-to-one -one means one user, one account, or one company entity on your application used to be mapped to a single zero OS1 access token, which works only for one single zero organization. In OS2, we have a one-to-many relationship, which means OS2 token can be used for more than one organization. This means the structure of storing zero token will inevitably change because identity mapping is different. A common problem that can surface is if an app has one account, one organization mapping in OS1, after migration, it treats tokens still for one single zero organization. When the same user authenticates two separate zero organizations into two separate accounts on their, on their side, it will introduce a duplication in storing zero tokens because the same zero user, even though there might be two different users uh, belonging to two accounts in, your, in the other app, they still generate the same token. When you store that, it will create a duplication in zero token in the system. This will get refresh token logic into a race condition. When one account refreshes the token, the other token is made invalid. So it tries to refresh again, which invalidate the other access token. When one account reconnects zero manually, when user find out issue, it will revoke the other account zero access as well because it's sharing the same token. This is one of the many issues you may encounter if your code logic does not respect the user-based token concept in OS2. To make things easier, many apps will re re enforce one account, one zero user, and one zero organization mapping in OS2. We have made this feature possible by providing a disconnect function and a connection endpoint to disconnect redundant zero organization on behalf of the user. So you can treat last organization user authorized, always used for that account. If you have questions on this, please feel free to raise it in the Q&A window so we can discuss it later in the webinar. As many of you know that accountants and bookkeepers are one of the largest user group of our software. This means a very large percentage of our user accounting or zero blue user, we call it, uh, are actually associated with multiple zero organizations. 
The ability to connect to multiple zero organization is one of the many benefits of zero OWASP 2 framework. This pattern opens up creativity in how you build your integration, which can potentially allow you to serve a larger user group in the ecosystem. That is to tap into the accountant and bookkeepers channel. And in general, all of these benefits hopefully can give you more leads, increase adoption of your integration, and make it easier for our shared customers to benefit from a simpler and more secure access to their financial and accounting data. So what exactly we're talking about in OS1 when we talk about tokens? In reality, when we talk about access token, we really are talking about what I refer to as a token set. Token set is a collection of data to manage your current and future authentication state. It contains assembly of JWT, which stands for JSON Web Token, that stores information required to authenticate. It is known as a stateless authentication in the industry. It is a standard for platform-based businesses. The access token is the only token required to make an API call, but ultimately you want to set up storage for the whole token, such as refresh token and tenant ID to pursue long-standing, sorry, you might store more than one uh, tenant ID to pursue long-standing API connection. In the industry standard for OWASP 2 framework, the access token can be as long as up to 4,000 characters. So you should consider changing your database store to support large text strings, JSON objects, or store them in parts, for example, in various columns. Or OWASP 1 and OWASP 2 access token can only last for 30 minutes. In OWASP 1.0a, we used to have something called a session handle uh, to refresh the expired access token. In this session handle does not expire. Well, technically it expires in 20 years, but it is long enough to be considered an eternity to some integrations. OWASP 2 has the same concept, but it's called refresh token, which lasts for 60 days. So it is important to know that you will need to build a refresh token logic to refresh at least one once every two months, even if the user did not trigger an API call. Once per month is probably a good, uh, good way to do it. If you're not using the SDK, um, the code change, you might be in a comfortable solution because the code change is not as much. The underlying data structure, so the requests, responses that you send, that you send and receive from us did not change in this migration. We only changed how you authorize or get users authorization. So if you tweak your existing headers of in your code base, it should work. If you're using one of our SDKs or the community built SDKs, you'll need to take a look at our new SDKs to estimate the changes you'll need to make. The new SDKs that Zero maintain is not uh, backward compatible with the OWASP 1 SDKs. The team's focusing on adding new API sets at the moment, and there's no plan to make the uh, OWASP 1 SDKs work for OWASP 2. So in OWASP 2 token set, there are two new things introduced. Uh, to new concept. One is the scopes. So we now support incremental authorization. The idea is that when you initiate an OWASP 2 request, you will ask what kind of information, uh, ask your user what kind of information you will be accessing and grant their ex, uh, consent. Uh, the scopes are explicit permissions that you're asking your user to give to your app. You should ask their permission incrementally as if it's a software on your phone, asking for camera access or microphone access, for example. Um, let's, let's use a real example. Uh, if you're a reporting app, you probably require read-only access. You don't need to ask permission to write. You will likely to just ask for accounting.transaction.read and scopes related to accounting reports and nothing else. You also need to call out that if you pass offline access in your scope list, OWASP 2 authorization will return the refresh token to allow you to refresh the access. This is how you achieve persistent connection, like the upgrade you have from public app to partner app in OWASP 1. For the ID token, 
would return basically the user information in zero back to you in a JWT format, which you can decode and, uh, and get the user's uh, name, email address, for example. This will require open ID, profile, and email scopes, depending on, depending on how much information you want your API to return. It is important to know that this open ID scopes are not scopes you can migrate from the existing OAuth1 token. You will need to have your user reauthorize in order to get their consent to pass the user data to your application. If those scopes are added later, zero will return uh, ID token over here. Think th this ID token will allow you to instill some trust in your user signing or sign up process which you can offer as a single user experience. Think of it like a Facebook or a Google login, but for SMB and accountants and financial, for financial applications. I really enjoy the part of my job where I get the opportunity to speak to some of our app partners and developers Recently, I've spoken to a few who have completed the migration process, and I've learned a few things I'd like to share with you today. So following are the five tips I would like to share with you, so you can consider against your specific architecture or setup during your migration planning. First, always migrate in batches. When I worked in the telecom system in my last job, whenever we have an upgrade or deployment, we always migrate users in batches over a few days time. Never have we done a big band style migration because the risk of it is just too high, often too high. So a good approach in migrating user is to do a small batch first, a few users or 50 users. Observe the traffic logs on the system for a while to see if it is stable. Check the refresh logic to see if that's working. Maybe you have forgotten the offline access scope somehow in production deployment. And then on another one until, you know, another batch until the whole user base is migrated over. This does mean, however, you need to maintain two separate code bases and sync logic running in parallel for a while. It takes a lot of effort, but it guarantees minimal risks and little impact to the software business. If you have 20 connections in total, this might not be so applicable. However, if you have 2000 connections, triggering this as a single batch job on Friday afternoon is probably not a good idea. Hey, Gracie, could we please send out the second poll? I wanna get an idea of uh, the size of migration uh, on the, uh, with the developers on the call here. Thank you. So I'll go on with the tips. Tip number two, refresh the token before migrating. You need to, you actually need to have to have this step before you can migrate. Um, the OAuth 1.0a is essentially, migration endpoint is essentially an OAuth 1 call. For OAuth 1 call to work, you must have a valid token. Because we don't have the disconnection function in OAuth 1, we must see a valid token to be sure that you have user's authorization to issue you a new pre-authorized OAuth 2 token. So before the migration job, Run a batch job to refresh all OS1 tokens. Don't attempt to migrate users that have failed this step. The user authorization might have been lost or revoked already. After getting the OS2 token, you will need to make sure that your code base is able to handle the OS2 refresh logic reliably. As I mentioned earlier, it lasts for 30 minutes. The access token lasts for 30 minutes. The refresh token lasts for 60 days. You want to really test out that refresh logic before you go on, because if you don't, you, your user will need to reconnect as your organization after 60 days. Tip number three, store your last working OS1 token during the migration. Make sure you keep the OS1 token you use for migration for a reasonable amount of time frame after the migration job. If something goes wrong, you can migrate the same OS1 token over to OS2 again. In fact, you can do it multiple times. So in other words, you can recover the OS2 token from the last valid OS1 token until March 2021. 
which uh, we fully ex ex fully deprecate the whole system, including the tokens. So it's okay if it is expired, but it has to be the last valid token. This will be a fail safe in the migration. Don't throw it away. Tip number four, create your OWASP2 application credential from your existing partner app. This is not much of a a tip, it is actually a requirement. Many developers ask me whether they need to create a new OWASP2 app for the migration. The answer is no, you must use the original OWASP1 partner app for it. it. It can be found on the same application page on your developer portal under my apps dashboard, where you find your OWASP1 credentials. When you supply a full redirect URL shown on the screen, you will be able to get the client ID and client secret, generate client secret for the migration. This will allow the migration point work for your application because it tells Zero that you are indeed the same application migrating from OWASP 1 to OWASP 2. Localhost is accepted um, as a redirect URI, so you can test it in your local environment for the production app. This will also allow your app to inherit some connection counts and permissions on the existing partner app. So for those of you who are already certified, using this, doing this is a very important step to ensure you still have the certified status in OWASP 2. Otherwise, reach out to API at zero.com or the developer evangelist you're dealing with, we can sort it out for you. You'll not be able to migrate and have the seamless user experience if you create a new OWASP 2 app. That's the key message here. Tip five and the last one, leverage one of our supported software development kit to ease your development. As part of the OWASP 2 rollout, we decided to create zero build and supported client SDKs for all major languages in the ecosystem. These are SDKs generated based on the Zero Open API specification project to help developers with building to OWASP 2 quickly. We currently have six supported languages, frameworks, .NET, Java, Ruby Node, PHP, and Python. I know some developers have made their own uh, wrapper around our OWASP 2 APIs. Feel free to explore those one as well in the community. Our SDK supports OWASP 2 authorization flow fully but feel free to use your own OWASP 2 library and just use the SDK for API client features. You don't have to write your own script uh, to, to do the migration job. We actually have written a script in Ruby and also in .NET. So if the environment is right, you can download them and keep them as handy command line utility tools for the migration job. You only need it to use it for a period of time. Hey Gracie, let's send out the last pool to everyone uh, to get a feeling of where they're at. I can see the result from the last pool, how many connections, and majority of people have less than 25 connections. So the third pool is out. I'm gonna keep going and wait for people to respond. Next, uh, it's demo time. I'm going to give you a demo of migrating a token, actual live token from OWASP 1 to OWASP 2. So on a high level, this migration demo works like this. I have an OWASP 1.0a application that is written in Ruby with the help of our community SDK Zeroizer gem. Um, I have a user created over there, which I intend to migrate. The user have already connected to a uh, OWASP 1 token, in fact, we'll create that connection. And then we'll use the migration Ruby script that we have, my colleague Chris and I have built, um, and then convert that to a OWASP 2 token. Before I do that, I'll make sure that the user on the OWASP 2 app, which represents the version two of, of your application or integration logic, um, also gets migrated there. I'll, I'll just create it manually. Well, feel free to pause me, uh, put something in the chat if you if you find it confusing at some point. Let me switch my screen to my desktop. Alrighty, so I'm sharing my screen now. 
So I've got a few programs loaded. I use v VS Code, Visual Studio Code these days. Uh, what you're seeing on the screen right now is Zeroizer demo app that I have made for this migration. It is leveraging the Zeroizer community gym. Um, this simple program would just uh, manage the user login, fire an API to organization endpoint and get the organization information out. I'll start the server to see how it works. Rails server from the command line. It should be running on um, 3000. Fingers crossed, nice. So I'll switch a, a few screens to the browser uh, incognito. Uh, we're on the developer.zero.com, which is great. Go to localhost 3000, and we're seeing the 0 1.08 uh, for the partner app migration. I'm going to try to log in. doesn't allow me because it doesn't recognize me as a user. I'll sign up with my email address with my simple password. So I've signed up. Now to show you that I haven't connected to zero yet, I'll go to the console, to the database and show you where I store the token in OS1. I like this feature, this terminal uh, is really handy. So extra terminal screen. Ooh, I just did something wrong. No, I don't want a third one. So here we go. So on, on, the, on the second terminal, I'm going to go to Rails console. Now Rails console is a handy tool that uh, Ruby Rails application offers the developers to interact with uh, a lot of things in the program. Um, that includes database model. So when you migrate database from the code base, any changes in the model gets interpreted into the zero, uh, sorry, the Ruby database, uh, Rails database uh, faithfully. So an user object, which I specify here, uh, gets created as a table and it has uh, the relevant parameters stored in columns. So in the console, if I do user.all, you'll be able to see the user that's been created. Right? I didn't give it a name, which is fine, but it's got an ID one and it's got an access token nil. So there's nothing there. In OS1, we only need to store a string. So we call it access token. So now I'll go to front end, connect to my zero application, which your user have already done. I need to sign in. Hopefully I don't need to go through 2FA in front of you. Sweet, you remember my uh, 2FA authentication. I can select only one organization in OS1 and I confirm this is my demo app. I'll allow access. Zero will call back with the necessary things I need to exchange for a token, and it has done that successfully. I managed to get the access token. Access, access key is actually something specific to Ruby Zero Rise Gem, so I don't need to use that. Basically, this will allow me to fire an API call to the authorized organization. I've already made an organization call, so you can see my name, my text number, masked for my fake company and registrate the member, et cetera. So this works. Let me go to the Ruby console, Rails console and do user all. You'll be able to see in my database, user database, the user Jenks now has access token as such. It is a string. So that's, that's all I need. I can shut this uh, OS1 application down now because now I have the token, I can migrate it. So this screen you're seeing here is the migration script that Chris and I created. Um, Migration.rb is the only file there. I'll quickly go through what it does. It's got a few things that you need to configure because in migration, we need to know that the partner app in OS1 is migrating to the partner app in OS2. So you will need to put in your consumer key which work for the OS1. We use this to identify which app it is coming from. You will need scopes, which I touched on earlier. You will need to have a valid scope for in OS2 for the APIs to work or the authorization to work. And notice that I don't have open ID scopes. Open ID profile and email are all open ID scopes. I don't have them because they can't be migrated. If I do this, it will have an error. 
you return an error. I also have my corresponding client ID and client secret here stored. So these credentials all belong to the same partner app with the same partner app ID in the developer portal. The script utilizes the migration endpoint, which is shown here. It will set up some complex headers here and do a bunch of things that will make it work. It will recursively go through tokens, a set of tokens and spit out them in a, in a different file. So that file, input file is OWASP1 underscore tokens dot JSON and the output file is here, OWASP2 tokens. I'll just show you quickly. So tokens is an array of JSON objects with just one key and value pair. You're supposed to put your token here, which I'll do, save. And output will be in this array in a token set, uh, one by one. So if you put another token or another token, uh, it will recursively fire the API calls to the migration endpoint and get you the pre-authorized or two token sets. To do this, quite simple, Ruby migration.rb and hopefully it work. Yes. All right. So ignore the other printouts. I think it's from the previous ones. But what we have ended up with is one output file, one object here. That is called a JSON object inside of an array. It's actually wrapped around the, as a string, but um, we'll, we'll take it. So the access token is returned here, and that is a long one. Look at that. It's got 130, uh, 1,305 characters. So it is long. That is because if you decrypt it, you get all the information rela related to the, to the token, like expiry time. The refresh token is here, 64 strings. You need to have that to be able to refresh the access token. Expiry time, 1800 seconds, that's half an hour. So it only lasts for half an hour, but the refresh token and lasts for 60 days, so you can refresh it. And also one more important thing, zero tenant ID. With the access token and the zero tenant ID, you can then make an OWASP2 API call. I'm going to copy this. And uh, I will I'll go to the OWASP2 application. It is a good idea to leave it to the IT guys, Rodney. Um, maybe the command line is uh, confusing to you. So in OWASP2, uh, application. So this is my OWASP2 application. It's, use, it's using the zero Ruby gem. And this is just a straight out of our repository, uh, the starter app. We have tweaked it, tweaked it a little bit slightly for this demonstration. If I fire it up, you'll be able to see it has a new, slightly different front end. So the idea is we're going to fire this up. This will be your OWASP2 code base. And then we'll insert the uh, access token to this user. We also have to create that user here, but it, that user doesn't have you created on your side because you probably still use the same user database that you got there. So it's running on 3000. I'm still showing my old, um, old OWASP one screen because I left it there. So if I go to localhost 3000, it, rec it, it recognized me as a new user. So I can't really log in. So no, I'll sign up to pretend that I'm still the same user. Sign up, okay, so you recognize me, it's great. Let me see if I have, uh, I have two sessions here. I'll just clean it up because I got the session from the last application and I got the session from the new OWASP2 application. So I have dual identity here. I'm going to remove the zero riser demo app so it doesn't confuse me with someone else probably doesn't do any harm. Anyways, I'm, I'm logged in, so I can go ahead and connect to zero, but the whole point of this migration is to avoid users from clicking on this uh, thing and go through authorization again. So they should be migrated with no disruption whatsoever. Um, some applications run their integration on the backend, so users never go back to the user interface. So doing that, 
to some applications is a lot. So that's why we designed this. So the server is still running, but we can manipulate the database directly by going through Rails console. I can spell it right. The fingers are still waking. It is uh, 11.30 a.m. in Melbourne, but my room is still pretty cold. So Rails console. All right, I'll show you the user. Here we go. So user Jenks is found and uh, the token set is nil. So I call this token set, but in my OWASP one application, I call it an access token. So here we are. Uh, we also have a active tenant ID, which is nil. Now we're going to insert the token set we got from OWASP two token migration script and insert into the database to the format that I my application likes. Uh, and my colleague Chris has made a really handy helper tool to do that. So in the Ruby Rails console, if I use this method, uh, helper method, set token set from file, it will take my email address, look up the user in the database, find the user. It will then take an input file, which is token set.json in the apps and data folder. So I've got it loaded up here, it's got nothing. But what I need to do is I'll need to put it in. This will be my input file for me to insert this string into my database. So back to the helper method, uh, the token set, I will uh, pass it into a JSON object. So my database, SQL database will actually take a JSON file and store it there. And then the user will be updated. So the token set will be updated and the active tenant ID as a string will be stored as well. So let's see if that works. There should be oh, helpers. Actually this helper set token set from, oh, my pull just got into the way. So I can see that uh, more than half of people uh, is having their migration on the backlog to be to complete for March 2021. That's good news. So that means this will help you. Token set set from file, and I'll need to put in my email address so it finds my user by email. Now helper dot set token set from file and it'll execute all of this for me as if I'm manip manipulating the database. I could use SQL uh, queries to do this, but I really suck at um, uh, SQL queries now. So that seems to work. I've recognized this uh, command line printout. Um, what I'll do is I'll show you the user doll to show you that indeed, I didn't lie to you, uh, that the token set is inserted and also the active tenant ID is inserted. So that's great. Checking the server, it is still running. So if I go to here, if I refresh, I should be able to see uh, that it recognizes it's already connected to the to zero. So the decoded access token is here um, because it's able to get that crazy string and decode it into something sensible like expiry time, etc. And I also lost seven minutes in this token just. Uh, by expanding the process. The reset, rest of the token set, we got the refresh tokens, we can refresh, expiring time, etc. They're all uh, inserted into the database by the um, migration uh, script end result. Now, theoretically, it should work if I just hit one of these features to fire an API to zero, but there is some quirky thing with uh, this starter app, so I can't do that uh, without refreshing it. So I'm going to refresh the token. So that's a new OWASP 2 token that just got migrated. I'm going to refresh it. So I got a new set of token and parameter populated in my software. This can be done programmatically as well. You don't have to get the user to do it, uh, just to be clear. So I've successfully refreshed the token. Everything is fine, looks good. Now I can go and get user information. So contacts, those are all of the contacts that I've stored. Let's see if I have any employees. Nick Fury, um, Nick Fury 1, 
So the clone of uh, Nick is there as well. So that's the end-to-end -end process of migrating from OWASP 1 to OWASP 2. So that's a, like a whole, whole journey of how an OWASP 1 token gets uh, moved to OWASP 2, just showing the, the process again. So we had the OWASP 1 app, we had the user, which is duplicated to OWASP 2, and then we have the token through the help of the, the script, migration script. We got a valid OWASP 2 token and is able to refresh it and fire API call on the back end without having the user to do anything. That's all from me uh, for the demo part. I'm going to uh, open up the floor and get Gracie to um, see if there's uh, any good questions coming up in the webinar. I have a moderator moderated yes. uh, question sheet here. Oh, yeah, we've, um, we've got quite a few questions that have come through, which has been really great to see. So um, nice. I'm just going to start with the um, first one. Um, is the authorization code flow supported to use in server apps for internal systems integrations? Yeah, so authorization code flow requires user to go to login at least once. So you need to have some sort of a way to redirect user to uh, zero login once. But after that, you'll get an access token and a refresh token. Your server can maintain that consistent, persistent connection uh, for the user on an ongoing basis. Code flow and the PKCE flow, we have, have to get the user authentication first. You can do that as a manual step. Um, if you include the offline access, you'll be able to get the refresh token and maintain it that way. We have made cool. some command line cool. tools as well to help you to get that access token out. Um, yeah, just to let you know, you can check out our repo. Cool, and next question. Um, when we migrate from OAuth 1.0a to OAuth 2, do we need to update the open SSL certificate? Uh, I'm not too sure. Uh, how to answer that by open SSL certificate, you might be talking about the private and public key pair that, you, um, that you're you used to in OS 1. Uh, I actually forgot to show you in, uh, in uh, the migration script that I also have the, my private key here. So without a private key, the partner connection will not work in OS 1. You have to upload a partner, a public key to zero as well. So we basically the communication is signed. But in OWASP 2, you don't have to do any of that. And that's one of the benefits of OWASP 2. It's all delegated to SSL certificate, SSL. So you need to use HTTPS in that communication. I hope that answers your question. Cool. Um, next question. Once the token gets refreshed, is the original token still valid until its expiry date or does it get invalidated? Okay, so that's a good question. Great question. Um, the, so access token lives for 30 minutes. Once you refresh that, uh, on the back end, that access token will still work for its lifetime. It doesn't get invalidated immediately. We do have a revocation endpoint for you to revoke that within like a couple of minutes or so. Also. Um, the refresh token is the one that gets invalidated because once you refresh, we consider that refresh tokens uh, purpose is fulfilled and it will become invalid in 30 minutes time. We gave us a 30 minutes grace period on any refresh token that you use to refresh. That is because sometimes when, you're, when your refresh logic didn't work and failed to grab the new refresh token and access token, we want you to be able to retry within the 30 minutes window. A good way to handle that is to try to refresh and then put in a circuit breaker logic or retry logic to retry it in a, in a random time, in three, five minutes time. Retry it a few times. You can, you can actually refresh as many times as you like, but you need to keep the last valid access token and refresh token in your code base to, to maintain on an uh, ongoing basis. Okay. And um, next question is, um, how does the scope work when we migrate to a user to OAuth 2? Do we get the full scope by default? So now you'll have to, you'll have to put it in a migration script that you, that, you, that you did. So if I go to my share screen, I'm still sharing my screen, right? Yeah. 
So over here in the migration script, when you use the migration endpoint, um, you need to specify the scopes that you want access to. Now in OWASP 1, we have the on and off switch. So once user authorized, you get access to all of the accounting endpoints by default. Payroll, payroll endpoints has some additional permissions or scopes you need to add in OWASP 1 authorization, but by default, you get all of the uh, OWASP 1 accounting scopes. But in OWASP 2, we need to let you to define that and ask users permission. So you need to specify the scopes. And remember, you don't have access to open API, uh, oh, sorry, open ID, profile, and email scope in this migration. If you want those user information, you'll need to ask them to re-log in and, uh, and authorize your app. Cool. Next question is, does the user need to re-allow access after 60 days just to update the stored refresh token? Uh, no, so you don't need to. It's an easy one. Uh, the refresh token expires every 60 days, but it's a rolling 60 days. Uh, when you refresh it, you'll get a new access token, which lasts for 30 minutes. You'll get a new refresh token as well, which lasts for another 60 days. So as long as you make sure your refresh logic refresh it before a refresh token expires, uh, you, can, you don't have to ask users to do anything. And this comes default. That's the beauty of OWASP 2. Um, when you create an app, when you're uncertified, you also get that benefit. Cool. Next question is, um, does the official .NET SDK support injecting custom HTTP client? Um, the person who asked this question said it's a requirement of theirs. Yeah, there's a bit of discussion on um, going on on the uh, SDK we have written. So we realized that all HTTP client factory interface that we use uh, relies on a .NET Core library in uh, something called an identity model. So we're doing some assessment work right now and doing some testing to improve that. So we dropped that uh, HTTP client factory dependency and we'll change that to HTTP client. Uh, so it's, it's, it supports .NET framework and the other UI type of application better. Uh, but we, we need to test it solidly before we release. That will be a breaking change to the people who are already using .NET SDK, especially on the, on the .NET Core side. So it's a dilemma that um, we have, but we have um, now committed to changing that in the future. Hopefully it will come after this webinar um, in, a, in, a, in a couple of weeks time. I'm on it. Um, uh, we, I hope that .NET uh, 5 will, will, will free us all from these uh, different versions of .NET. Cool. Um, next question is, um, we are using zero net SDK to sync data between zero and their app. Can we use the zero net standard for all of two, but keep the sync logic with zero net? Or do we have to completely switch over to zero net standard SDK? So if you manage to get any of the old SDKs to work with all of two, you can keep uh, keep going like that. It's 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 a little bit the it's a little bit like you have uh, created your own API interfaces with us or the clients API clients and messages with us. The underlying API structure, the request responses didn't change. So theoretically, you can just use the new SDK OS two for OS two interfacing. And after you get the access token and the tenant ID, you can just use your old SDK or old code base for that. So yeah, that's uh, completely possible. Cool, next question. Um, I noticed in the release notes for uh, the, the net standard SDK, there are some changes to the identity API. API. Um, I'm wondering if Jenks could elaborate a little bit more on what the added support for auth event ID query parameter for all methods means. Sweet. Uh, yep, I can elaborate on that. So, um, so OWASP 2, we mentioned earlier in OWASP 2 flow, one user can authorize more than one organization. And in, we also added a feature that is in trial with some partners called bulk connections. I'll just show you quickly over here, partner benefits, bulk connections. So it is a flow where user gets, goes through the OWASP 2 flow, but select multiple zero organizations 
for example, an accountant or bookkeeper who has access to many organizations, and they can like select multiple of them and go back. Now, when this gets implemented, we get feedback from developers that we can't tell which, on which authorization flow user have uh, connected what organization because they want to they want to know that um, somehow. I forgot the use case. So in OWASP two, in OWASP code flow, we have added a parameter, which now supports, which tells you that. So in the connections endpoint you will get ID, which identifies this connection. So connection ID, you will need that to disconnect this organization. You get tenant ID, which is organization ID. So you get the time, created time, updated time. Now theoretically, if the created time is the same, then you can tell that it is from the same authorization flow. But we have gone extra uh, mile to make sure that you know exactly which one is which by adding the authentication event ID which identifies which exactly event of authorization these organizations are connected by the user. So that's, that's what it is for. The next question is, um, if the access token is only for 30 minutes, what happens if it expires while you're uploading data to zero? So the, I presume that you mean another API call, so uploading data, not the same call. And uh, so the access token is only for 30 minutes. If you have a call happen to happen on the exact 30 minutes time, that call will still go through because we're still responding it um, to, the, to, the, to the valid access token. But if you try to make another API call, you'll, you'll be returned a, a error, token invalid error. That you can you can counter that by building a refresh logic when you encounter that uh, uh, that exception or that um, validation error from our API. So basically, doing a refresh and then continue march on with your rest of the the API call flow. Those are good questions. Cool. Um, next question is: uh, Do you know when the remaining API sets will be released for the PHP SDK? Oh, I, I'm not a current maintainer of PHP, um, but we're working on it. Hopefully it will come out soon. Uh, cool. PHP is really popular. Yeah, it is. <laughs> um, and um, uh, is the, is the um, 2.0 SDK compatible with the .NET framework? Uh, 2.0 SDK? So yes, so 2.0 is compatible in its, uh, in its way, if you're using .NET Framework 4.6.1 and above, it should work for you. The, we're targeting, when we build the SDK, we're targeting the .NET Standard 2, version 2, which uh, should work for .NET Core 2.0 above and .NET Framework 4.6.1 and above. Uh, but we use the HTTP client factory library dependency that seems to be uh, working very well with core or only works with, uh, with core. For .NET Framework, you can download, use another package called Michael, Microsoft Dependency Injection Package to implement it um, like you have the dependency injection feature in the .NET Core uh, to still get that work. I have written a example in .NET Framework. If you go to uh, the repo and search for .NET Framework, uh, you'll be able to, to find the example and see how that works. Uh, we'll make a change in the future to make it work better for .NET Framework uh, in the future, as I mentioned earlier. Cool. And um, next question. Um, what happens if I make an API call for an organization that has already been migrated? Will I get a specific response indicating the organization has migrated? So the scenario is you're trying to migrate the same organization again, is that right? Yeah, I think they're saying if they, if they have already migrated an organization and they attempt it again, what would happen? So, um, will issue you the, the uh, as I said earlier, the, the OS one token, the last valid one, if you migrate again, will give you a new OS two token. Uh, but I'm not sure what happens to the old OS two token that you've uh, migrated. I think it invalidates that, but I can get back to, uh, to whoever raised that 
later. E email api at zero.com or leave your contact details uh, in the chat probably to our moderators or so we'll be able to get back to you on that. It's a good question. Cool. Um, I've got an, a couple of questions here around um, whether the .NET 1.0 SDK is compatible with the .NET S2.0 uh, SDK. Do you want to just um, rephrase that a bit so it's a bit clearer for everyone, Jinx? Yeah, sure. So the .NET, 2. Uh, .NET SDK, specifically that one uh, for OWASP 2, does not work with the OWASP 1 version of the .NET SDK. It is not uh, backward compatible. We use a different method to generate those SDKs by using Open API Generator and also following the API specification project that we have. So it works uh, quite differently in how you call different methods. Uh, the API end up getting sent to the uh, to zero is the same, but the way you call them is different. So they're not uh, they're not backward compatible. Cool and. Um... Next question that I have here is um, asking whether if a user, if multiple users connect the same organization, does that, does OAuth 2 allow for that or does the connection get invalidated when an organization is connected twice? Uh, so the same user connecting to the same organization, that will, consider, that will be considered a refresh of the authorization. Um, the, the, the token is tied to one user, one organization. So if it is the same user and same organization, that will be a, a access token that gets refreshed. So the old one will not work. Uh, and anymore. what happens if it's two different users connecting the same organization? You get two tokens, two different tokens. Yeah. Cool. They work independently. Awesome. Um, I think that's all of the questions that we have time for at the moment. So I'm going to hand back over to Jordan to wrap us up. Thanks, Grace and Jenks. Uh, hopefully that gives everyone a better idea of some ways you can migrate over to OAuth2.